Okay, welcome back after break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking at the third guidepost, recognize the stirring within, okay? And I gave you a biblical example about Nehemiah. No, we don't need it. I also gave you my uh, life example as well, okay? So, um, so the stirring within is something that God moves our hearts. So we need to really recognize that stirring. We need to ask ourselves, what is it that I'm really passionate about? What are you really passionate about? So to understand your stirring, you need to ask these questions. What am I really passionate about? Okay. Uh, what, what is that that really stirs me up? Or what is that that really moves me? Or, you know, what is, uh, what I mean is, you know, what is that? One thing that I will sacrifice my night's sleep. You know, even if I have to sacrifice my night's sleep, what is that? So I know I've seen myself sacrificing sleep, sacrificing things just for children's ministry because I enjoy just doing it. Ask me to do anything else, I'll not. So I know when I was, uh, you know, I was part of APC's Children's Church, they all, the team used to make fun of me because they used to get all my messages at 1, 2 in the night because I'll be working till 1, 2 in the night. So, you know, they'll all make fun of me. And, you know, because that is something that I'm so passionate about, so I'm willing to give up everything for that. So you need to ask yourself, what is that one thing that I will sacrifice everything? I will sacrifice my sleep or I will sacrifice even the last penny or the last rupee that I have. Or what is that thing that really excites me? What is it? You know? So what is that really, that, that thing that really excites you, that energizes you? I know that when I'm doing children's ministry, I get superly energized. It really excites me. It uh, really moves me forward. And I'm super excited and thrilled about doing that. So you need to ask yourself these questions and then you will know what is that stirring within. Then you will know what is God calling you to do and what is his plan and purpose. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, things that we just do it just for a job. Somebody's asking you, hey, take this, do this as a job. Not the thing that I just do for a job or just do for a living or um, you know, some things that I do just to get past things. But, you know, or do things anyway, just because I have to do it. But, you know, underneath all of those things is something that really you're passionate about, that is exciting, that energizes you, that you can just keep running irrespective of what you face. You're able to understand? So what really stirs up your heart? I'll give you an exa other example from Acts chapter 17. It's um, on in your books on page number 15. Okay, the bottom of page number 15, Acts chapter 17 uh, and uh, Acts chapter 18. Can somebody read those two references, please, quickly? Where's the mic? Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the place of worship with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. When Sila and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. So here we see Paul is in Athens during his second missionary journey. And Athens was known to be very famous for a center of philosophy, learning, discussion. Many of the great philosophers, the Epicureans, the Stoic philosophers were all from Athens. Also, Athens was a city which was filled with idols. So one of their courtiers said that you know you'll find more idols than men in athens okay so that is more than human beings you'll find more idols in athens so that is what he was saying that means there's so much of idolatry there so when paul goes to athens he stirred up provoked in his heart means what he was stirred up in his heart he was stirred up in his heart to see the idols and he was stirred up in his heart to preach not only to the jews but also to the Gentiles, the good news of the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so we see that even when Silas and Timothy, who Paul left in Macedonia, so before he comes to 
Athens. Paul leaves and he, uh, and he goes on to Thessalonica. So before he going to Thessalonica, he goes. Uh, he first starts a journey from Macedonia. He leaves Paul and Silas there. Uh, sorry, he leaves Silas and Timothy there. And when they come back, you know, he's compelled in his spirit. That means he's stirred up in his spirit to testify to the Jews that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means he's stirred up in his spirit to preach and teach to the Jews and to Gentiles and all those who are filled with idolatry and idol worship to preach the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. So that was an inner feeling or inner stirring in your heart. So sometimes when you go to places and you see the idol worship, your heart is so burdened and God stirs up your heart to pray. You might not be a pastor, you might not be an evangelist, a missionary, but God is stirring up your heart to pray. You're somebody who's a very prayerful person, so you can use that. Or somebody, you are, you know, you are in, um, you're somebody in church, and um, you know, God is stirring up your heart to just, uh, you know, pray for people in your church who are single mothers or you know, going through divorce. God is stirring up your heart. So when God stirs up your heart to do something, to praise, to act, to move, do it. Maybe God is stirring up your heart uh, in your church to see that there is, there, you know, uh, religion is so dead, right? There is no kind of move of God. There is no, uh, the power of God is not manifested there. And God is stirring up your heart to pray. And you pray and God is stirring up your heart to speak to the pastor to, you know, whether you can preach some sermons or teach about the Holy Spirit, whatever. So you need to do that very, very prayerfully. Or sometimes there in your church, there is a lot of, uh, th there's division, there is strife or the pastor or some leader is not doing something right and God is stirring up your heart. He's saying, hey, come on, it's time to take action. Do something. And God will give you the steps that you need to take. So you're able to understand? Yes, so God stirs up our hearts and that stirring is for us to move and take action. Okay, so you can put that off. You're not going to... You'll have to press it once more. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to the next um, um, uh, guidepost. The next guidepost is recognize the grace of God that is given to you. Okay. Okay, if you have any questions, I would request you to type it in the chat section or maybe at the end of the class, I'll, I'll, I'll stop five minutes ahead of time and then I can give you some time for asking your questions, okay? So you can either type it in the chat section so I'll know it or if you run out of time, I'll have all those questions and I can answer them in the uh, Google stream page. I can post it in the classroom page in case I miss out on your questions, okay? So the next guidepost, the fourth one, is recognize the grace of God given to you. Now, what is the meaning of grace? Divine favor, divine empowerment, divine enablement, okay? In the New Testament, the, uh, the word grace is used in three different contexts. The first one is there in your notes. It talks about divine favor. Can somebody read Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 please? For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. So yeah, so it is you're saved by grace. Grace means divine favor. It's God's grace that he has given you salvation, forgiveness of your sins. Okay, so it is not by works but by grace through faith. The second one Grace is used in the context of divine character. So can somebody please read John chapter 1, verse 14, please? John 1, 14. It's there in your textbook, page number 16. Oh, it's not there. Okay, can somebody read it from the Bible? John chapter 1, verse 14. The word become flesh and made his dwelling among us. He have seen his we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So here it's talking about whom? Jesus Christ. And what is the characteristic that is mentioned here? 
full of grace and truth. So grace and truth is the character of God. Okay. So uh, uh, grace uh, can also mean divine character. Look at what Peter writes in Second Peter chapter three, verse eighteen. Senior textbook. But go in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the the glory both now and forever. Amen. Yes. So here it says that grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, to Him be the uh, glory both now and forever more. So we are asked to grow to become like. Jesus. Okay. We are to grow more and more to become Christ like in our character. Okay. So that is divine character. The third thing is divine enablement. So can somebody look at um, Second Peter? Uh, sorry. Can somebody read? Um, uh, yeah. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, please. Okay, before we look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, okay, I just like to mention here that, you know, when Paul uh, had this thorn in his flesh, okay, that was something from Satan that was hindering him or stopping him from doing his ministry. And what does Paul do? He prays to God. How many times he prays? Three times he prays to God. And what does God do? Does he remove that thing? No, but what does he say? My grace is sufficient for you. That means God is telling Paul, I'm, I'm going to em enable you, I'm going to empower you to go through this thing or to, you know, go through this, what Satan is doing and yet to fulfill the call and the purpose that I have for your life. Okay. So let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 now. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Yes, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So what is given to us? Grace. So every person, every believer, God has given us grace. Okay, so tell your neighbor, God has given you grace. So Christ Jesus has given each one of us more than one gift. He's given us one gift or more than one gift. He's given each one of us more than one gift. And the grace that is upon our lives enables us or that grace that God has given to us is connected or related to the gifts that Christ has given to us. And we look at how grace is connected to the gifts that God has bestowed upon our lives. And very interesting in this verse it says, but to each one of us grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay, which means each one of us are given different measures of the same gift. I'll repeat that again. Each one of us are given different measures of the same gift. I'll give you an example. For example, in this classroom, how many of you are here? Say 30 of you. Yeah. So 30 of you, just imagine that five of you have leadership gifts. Or five of you have the gift of leading worship. Okay. But all of you, even though you have the leadership gift, all five of you, or five of you have evangelism gift or missionary gift, or, you know, gift of leading worship, even though you have the same gift, but you can have different measures of that same gift. For example, all of five of you are worship leaders, but the measure of that gift will be stronger and greater and bigger for someone compared to another person. So for some, the anointing will not be so great. The level of influence will not be so great. The, the, it will not be so strong. The grace will not be strong compared to another person in the same room. That does not mean that God is 
partial because the numerous verses in the Bible, Romans chapter 2, verse 11 says, There is no partiality with God. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 also says, uh, God shows no partiality, He does not take any bribe, and also other passages. So, God is not being partial. Then, why is there different measures for the same gift? Why is there different measures for the same gift? Because greater the calling, greater the responsibility, greater the measure of grace. So another person who is a worship leader has, you know, a, a bigger measure of that gift compared to you as a worship leader. Why? Because that person has a bigger responsibility. So what should your attitude be? Your attitude should not be grumbling and complaining to God and say, God, you gave us the same gifts, that measure of that person is more than me. No, what we need to do and acknowledge and know that the measure of grace God has given us to fulfill that gift, that calling, that function that he has on our lives is enough to do it. So that means what God has given you, the grace to fulfill your calling, to fulfill your purpose, to fulfill your function, that is enough. So don't compare with others, don't be jealous of others, don't get angry with them, and don't be angry with God. Because what God has given you is sufficient to fulfill that assignment, that plan, that purpose for your life. Did you understand that? Yes or no? Yes? And so the other person would have had a greater measure because he, has a, he or she has a greater calling, greater responsibility, and they have more work to do, so more grace. Okay, and you know, um, there's a parable that Jesus taught about concerning the kingdom of God. He talks about this man in the vineyard. He goes out, I'm just paraphrasing it, okay, not like this in the Bible, paraphrasing it. He goes at nine o'clock in the morning, goes to the marketplace. He says, Hey, are you looking for a job? Yes, come to my vineyard and work. They said, Okay, I'll give you one denarius. Then he goes again at 10 o'clock, he does the same thing, and he says, Come and work, I'll give you one denarius. And maybe he goes at 12 o'clock. And maybe he goes again back at 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock. And the person who comes to work in his vineyard at 4 o'clock, he says, I'll pay you one denarius. Okay. And so at the end, when he's 6 o'clock, everyone is ready to go home. He tells his manager, pay the person who came in last one denarius. And also the one who came early in the morning at 9 o'clock, pay one denarius. And so the people at 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock would have been mightily excited and happy that they got one denarius. But what do you think the people at 9 o'clock would have done? They would have grumbled and revolted. They said, how can you do this? This is injustice. So what does the owner of the vineyard say? What did I promise you? One denarius. Did I pay you one denarius? Yes. And what does he say? Don't I have the right to do what I will with my money? So God is sovereign. He does what he wills. He's not partial. Okay. He chooses to show mercy to whom he wants to show mercy. He chooses to bless those he wants to bless. But we need to understand that when he's doing that, we don't complain and grumble and murmur. That is God. And we need to be happy for the person because we all belong to the same kingdom. We are children, heirs of God, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We're all part of the kingdom. So if God is blessing somebody in the kingdom work, we need to appreciate that. We need to be happy for that. We need to rejoice and we need to praise the king of the kingdom who is doing what he is doing and what he thinks best. Are you all able to understand? Many people quit ministry. Many people leave the church because of this. They say God is partial. He's not given me great anointing, uh, greater favor compared to that person. Look at he is a worship leader. I am also a worship leader. And they get upset and angry with God. Can't throw our attitude with God. We'll be the losers, right? We need to know God is loving, just. He's a just God, a righteous God. He will deal with us righteously and justly, okay? So what we need to do is we need to understand that the grace given for us is more than sufficient to do what we have to do. Now, my, um, can you just, yeah, charger, please? Yeah, laptop. Okay, let's move on. Um, can somebody read Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 6, please? Romans 12, 4 to 6. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many 
are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Amen. So here he says that we are members of one body. Which body? Human body? The Christ body. That is the church. Okay. So he says, in the body of Christ, all the members have the same function. No, we all have different functions. Some of us are prayer warriors, some of us are administrators, helpers, the welcome, uh, you know, welcome people, uh, welcome people, uh, ushers, people who are in the media team, people in the worship team, people in the evangelism team. So all of us have different functions, just like in the human body, okay, the physical human body, there are different parts of the body, different parts have different functions all the parts don't have the same function yes or no the same way in the body of christ okay but here it says that all the members have some function okay that means there's nobody here who can say i don't have a function to perform in the body of christ all of us have a function but if you say i don't have a function in the body of christ that means you don't know what is your function which God can help you and you can use these nine guideposts to find out your function now look at verse 5 it says so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one and other that means the functions that God has given us in the body of Christ whether it's to be a prophet a, a, a apostle a pastor a teacher an administrator a prayer warrior you know a helper whatever it is you know children's church minister youth minister whatever it is you know all our functions are interlinked okay just for example in the body all the parts of our body are inter linked right if i have a headache i can't function well right if my stomach is aching i can't function well right so any part of my body is sick my entire body kind of doesn't function in its proper state so my arm cannot say hey i'm going off on my own and i want to do what i want to do i don't want to be part of this body okay i don't want to do job myself can't do that the same way we are all dependent on each other as members in the body of Christ each of us have a function and each of us have to work together in unity and in oneness so that we can successfully enhance and further the kingdom of God okay so we cannot disconnect from each other. We need to be connected. That is how God has designed us. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use it. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Okay? So it says, having then meaning now because you've got a function in the body of christ and you have gifts that god has given you to fulfill that function so he's saying having then gifts what do you think these gifts are given to us for what are the gifts given to us to use for what to fulfill your function now suppose your function is to be a worship leader what do you think are the gifts god will give you yeah, of course, obviously to sing, right? To play some instrument. If you can't sing, play some instruments. I can't play an instrument. I can't sing. I can't say I'm, God has called me to lead worship, right? He's not called me to worship. Vinayan can play instrument. Can he, he can sing. We know that God has called him for worship. Some of us are good bathroom singers, praise the Lord. We can worship God there, but we can't lead. We can't lead worship in front of everyone. That's not a function God has given to us. And I, I ask some people, you know, you like to join children's ministry? They say, hey, no, no, I don't, I'm not cut off for children. You know, we, uh, I can't relate to children. I, you ask me to speak to youth, I can speak, ask me to speak to adults, but not to children because I can't get down to their level. You ask me to uh, speak to youth, I really can't relate very well to youth, to the youth topics. Ask me to speak to children, I'm you know, I'm very uh, confident and I, I enjoy doing it. Okay. So 
each of us have different functions. Now, for example, uh, if you have a function or a calling of a pastor, what are the gifts you need for that? Preach. You need to be rooted in God's word. What else? To, pastor. Take, to take care of the people. Yes. So pastor is a shepherd. You need to have that compassionate, loving, caring heart to take care of people. Pastor is not just come and preach and say, Tada, bye, bye, everyone, see you next Sunday. It's a caring role. It's a shepherd's heart, right? So that is what, you know, that is the gift that God has given you. So it's different functions have different gifts and God has given you the gifts to fulfill your function. Are you able to understand? Yes or no? Yes. yes. So if you're a youth minister, you will have the gifts to fulfill that function. So how do you know what is not your function? If you don't have the gifts for that, you know that's not your function, don't try it out. Okay. So he says, having then gifts differing. That means we've all been given different gifts, but the gifts that you have been given are more than enough to help to fulfill your function that God has for you in the body of Christ. So he says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Okay. So the gifts that are given to us are given, you know, are given according to the grace that is extended to your life. So you need to just understand these three things. You know, God has called you to a specific function in the body of Christ. So if you want to fulfill that function, he gives you the gifts and he gives you the grace. Simple as that. If you didn't understand anything else, just understand these three things. Function, gifts and grace. God has called you to be a teacher. He'll give you the gifts to be a good teacher and he will give you the grace, the divine enablement, divine favor to fulfill your role as a teacher. You're able to understand? Yes or no? Okay. So, for example, I, I told you about the worship leader, right? I may love to be a worship leader, okay? But what if I can't sing and I can't play any instruments? What will happen? I'll be a disaster, right? So, um, I know that God has not gifted me in that area. I can't be a worship leader. I'll be fooling myself, fooling God and fooling everybody else, okay? So, let's read the things that I given here in your uh, book, page number 17. It says the gifts in your life are indicative of the grace given to you. So how do you know your function, your calling in the body of Christ? You will know your function according to your gifts. What are your gifts? Okay. And the grace of God is also indicative of that gifts. The gifts given to you are in line with the function God has designed you to perform in the body of Christ. Okay, so God has given me the gift to teach children, to be childlike, to come down to a child, to child and relate to a child. That's why I'm very childish so many times, you know, behave like a child because I'm working with children and I also love children. Those are gifts that helps me fulfill my function that God has designed for me in the body of Christ. Now, the gifts and the calling of God go to together. Okay, Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That means cannot be changed. Okay, so your gifts and your calling always go together. The calling of God in your life is accompanied by the gifting of God. You cannot be called to a specific function if you don't have the gifts. I hope you're able to understand Okay, so if you're called to something and you think somebody says, hey, I think God is calling you to be a pastor. You know that it's not right because you can't preach, you can't teach. Okay, you're not a good preacher, you're not a good teacher. Or maybe you don't have that kind of shepherding heart. You say, no, I'm not cut out. I don't have the gifts for that. People can say, but you need to look at your own, the gifts that God has given you. Okay, so the gifting and the calling of all God always goes together. Okay, um, now another thing I just wanted to point out in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 9. What are some of the gifts given there that is mentioned in uh, verses 7 below? What are some of the gifts there or functions of the church? What are the functions of the church given there? Can you tell me? 
Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 9. What are some of the functions of the church? Hello, class. What are the functions? Prophesying. Serving. Serving. Teaching. Thank you. Giving. What else? Giving. Giving. Encouraging. Hello, all of you have Bibles. All of you have your notes. It's there. Please tell me. What else? Prophesying. Leading. Showing mercy. Look at Romans chapter 12. It's there in your book. Top of page number 17. Talks about the different gifts, uh, functions. Now you will find that not all functions are spiritual in nature. Yes or no? Prophesying is a spiritual in nature? Yes. What about showing mercy? Generously giving. Encouragement. Is that all spiritual gifts? Spiritual function? No. So not all functions that God calls us to is spiritual in nature. I'll give you an example. Okay. Now, um, all of us, or some of us can be called into leadership position. Okay. So you can be a team leader in the workplace. You can be a project leader. You can be a leader of an organization. You can be a leader of a, in a sports team. You can be a leader in a music team. You can be a leader in a political team as well. Okay. A political party, you can be a leader. So you think all of these leadership positions are spiritual in nature? No. No. Political uh, leadership, or you know, in a in a in a sports team, they're not spiritual. But what about worship leader? Yes. What about a youth leader? What about children's church leader? A spiritual nature? Yes. So all the function that God calls us to is not necessary to be spiritual in nature, but yet God will give you the gifts and the grace to enable to bring his kingdom into that specific sphere that he's raised you up to be a leader and to function as a leader. So the function of being a leader does not have to be spiritual in nature, but God can give you the gifts where he can use you to expand his kingdom even in the, uh, in the market place. Okay, all of you with me able to understand? Yes. So how do we discover the gifts that are in? Us. I'll just share a few things. It's not here in your textbook. Okay. One is by experimentation. You experiment. Okay. Just experiment a little bit. For example, you love to be a worship leader. You experiment playing a guitar or keyboard. Try it. I actually tried playing the guitar, but I didn't last for too long. I couldn't get through it. Okay. See what is the outcome. Okay, and see if your heart is in it, if you really enjoy it, if you, you know, you are finding you're passionate about it, you're doing it well, then maybe you have a gifting in that area. But if you're not able to make much progress, then you just be true to yourself and say, hey, this is not the area that I'm gifted in. Let me find another area that I have, I have find my gifting. I know you all have music class here, so I'm using that that as an uh, example, because I don't want you to feel disappointed and say, hey, he learned the guitar, he became a worship leader, I did not. So don't get disappointed because God has called us to different functions and he has given us different gifts. Okay. Now, sometimes we can be gifted in an area, but we don't know what is our gifting because that gifting is hidden inside us. So we think, hey, I don't have any function. I don't think I have any gifts because maybe you're always seeing the negative side of you. People are speaking the negative over your life. Always seeing yourself as a failure. But God has given each one of us gifts. We read that, right? Christ has given us one or more gifts. Amen? Yes. So what you need to do is you need to look into your life and see what is the gifts now for example you take an apple how when you cut an apple how which way do you cut it you cut it down like this or you dice it in the middle you down like this right you try taking an apple and dicing it down to the center like this right down you know what you see in between in the in the middle of course seeds but what will you see when you dice it down from the bit in, in the middle like this what will you see huh yeah, you will see seeds, but what else you will see? 
you see a star there yes you see a star if you have time i'll show you the the projectors this one but i'll show you the uh, the slide okay you see a star shaped in both the halves of the both the halves of the apple and in that star you will have seeds did you know there was a star in the middle of that apple no why because you're always cutting the apple like this so maybe you're looking at your life in a very negative way with all your failures but if you look at life in a different way, you will see that God has placed stars in your life. That means I'm saying gifts. Don't go and do a an, uh, scan and see where the star is. That means God has raised each one of us to be star material. They're not just superstars in the movie field and in the sports field. All of you, God can raise you up to be stars in his kingdom. Amen? Tell your neighbor you're a star in God's kingdom. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we need to identify our gifts, right? And also Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, Hey, Timothy, stir up the gifts that are in you. You know, Timothy is a young man and Paul has put him in the most difficult place in Ephesus where the leaders are there and this man is there and the young Timothy is struggling there. He wants to run away. Now, Paul is writing two letters during the end of his life and encouraging Timothy and saying, Hey, Timothy, stir up the gifts that is given to you by prophecy. When people have spoken over your life, don't let it be dormant. Stir up that gifts. Okay. So uh, we, we need to be, um, you know, we receive prophetic words, but we need to also be very careful with the prophetic words that we receive. Now, for example, you know, somebody goes and tells Vinay, supernatural hour, hey Vinay, you know, God has called you to be uh, set up a restaurant business. So Vinay is too excited. He leaves his job at APC. <laughs> he takes a bank loan of five lakhs. He goes and starts a restaurant business. And for the next four or five min months, Vinay is the only one who's eating from that restaurant. He has no business. And he is wondering what has happened. I got this prophecy. So what should you do when you receive prophecy? Test it out. How do you test it out? First Thessalonians 5, 20 to 21 says, Do not despise prophecy, but test all things so that the word has to be tested. How do you test prophecy? Through the word of God. God. So what Vinay has to do is wait on God, pray about it, and see her leading, and then when he, you know, shelf it for a bit, pray about it, and then he senses God's leading, he would move on, okay? So, that was just like a side note I gave you. We'll move on to see, uh, read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1, 7, and 8. So, can somebody please read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1, 7, and 8, please? For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for your Gentiles, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given to me by the effective working of His power. To me, whom I am less than the least of all the saints, this, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles that unsearchable riches of Christ. Amen. Elkanah, can you please mute your mic? Elkanah, can you please mute your mic? Can you please mute your mic, please? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So here Paul says, I became a minister. How did Paul become a minister? Look at those verses. How did he become a minister? What does it say? According to the gift of grace God has given to me. And then he says, by the effecting working of his power. So Paul says, hey, I have become something, okay? And what he became was determined by the gift of the grace of God that was given to him. So what you become in life, <coughs> sorry, what you become in life is determined by the gift of the grace of God that is given to you, okay? And then he says, the gift of the grace of God that given to me he continues writing he says by the effecting working of his power okay so there's something we need to understand here your function your gift of grace and the power of god are all connected 
Okay, I'll say that again. Your function, what God has called you to do in the body of Christ, your gift of grace and the power of God are all connected. So the power of God will flow through your life when you are in that right function and that God wants you to do and you are performing that function and you're using the gifts to fulfill that function, the power of God would move. So when you see people very powerful in ministry, you need to understand, hey, that they are in the function that God has called them to do. They are using the gifts that God has given to them and the grace that is upon their life. And that is why the power is flowing so powerfully. But if you're saying, hey, I think this is my function, but I'm not able to see any power. I'm not able to see any move of God. You need to question and ask yourself, are you in the right place at the right time doing what God has asked you to do? Because if you position yourself in the right place, the right time doing what God has asked you to do, then you will have the grace, you'll have the enabling, you'll have the empowerment, you'll have the power of God that will help you to fulfill your function in the body of Christ. But if anything is out of line, the power of God will not be operative in your life. Okay, so that is what we need to keep in mind. So don't waste your time trying to fulfill a function that you're not called to because you won't have the grace and you won't have the power of God and it will just leave you frustrated and unhappy. So here we learned in this um, uh, fourth point, fourth guidepost, that we need to discover the gifts that we have. We have, will have the grace. Your gifts and the grace will define your function, the area that God has called you, and his power will flow through your life, making you very effective in his kingdom. Okay? Okay, just a few more things that we can look at is in, um, if somebody can read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, please. But... To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on I, he led captivity. Are you reading Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11? Ephesians 4, and, 11. And he himself gave some of some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Okay. So here we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, but to each one of us, grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And we said, God has given us one or more gifts. But when Paul comes to Ephesians and he's writing Ephesians verse 11, he says, he says, but he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, this is called a fivefold ministry office. Now, God has given all of us gifts. He's also given us function in the body of Christ, but they are these five specific function that is specifically given by Jesus Christ for a selected few. That depends on Jesus Christ, who he calls to, to be an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, and a teacher. Yes. Um, Ma'am, you mentioned that apostles also, they some are called as apostles. Yes. So it is still nowadays in in this the office age. of the apostle you're meaning is, is no 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 in this age that we are living in the age right 2024 yes in this age also uh, apostles are there yes there are apostles and what is the difference between apostle and a pastor senior pastor an apostle is someone who goes to uncharted territory and and un, you know places where the gospel is not done or new work is not initiated they pioneer new work like paul he goes on his missionary journeys to new places where the Holy Spirit takes him and he teaches and preaches the gospel and he establishes churches where people have not gone before. Not that he goes, doesn't go to other places, he does. But a apostle is somebody who basically, you know, initiates or pioneers new work. But the same work is uh, done by pastors also and evangelists. Yes, a also pastor doing. can also be an apostle. The, the functions, these fivefold functions can also be interlinked in a person. A person can have all of these fivefold offices. Like uh, we can say, yes, uh, uh, Paul was an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher. He flew, he, he moved in all of these uh, fivefold offices. Even Jesus was also like, you know, in these fivefold offices, yes. Yeah. 
Okay. So we see that even though we all are called into different functions in the body of Christ, there are these five functions of a pastor, an apostle, a, a teacher, and an evangelist, you know, and a prophet that Jesus Christ specifically gives it to specific individuals. Okay. Again, we can't say he's partial. He does what he chooses and he wills. He's sovereign. Okay. So just to sum up what we are saying is that we need to recognize the grace of, the, of God that is given to us. Your gifts of grace reveal God's potential and the purpose for your life. And the way that God has designed you reveals the uh, the plan and the purpose or the gifts of the function that he has for your lives and the gifts of grace that God has given you it can be like a seed but you have to nurture it you have to grow it and it will develop and it will be useful in the kingdom of God now having said that you know the grace of God does not mean that you know when you have the grace of God to fulfill a function life is one big eternal vacation no Life is not an eternal vacation where you sit back and say, okay, God has called me to this function. He's given me the grace. Now I'm in the same position. I'm not moving. The power will flow. No. You know, look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Can somebody read that, please? 1 Corinthians 15, 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly that they all ate not I but by the grace of God which was with me. Amen. So what is Paul saying here? I am who I am or what I am by the grace of God. But even as the grace of God was lavished upon Paul's life, what is he saying? I also labored more abundantly than they all. So he's saying compared to his co-workers, he has labored even more okay so because god has given us grace in certain areas it doesn't mean that life is going to be a wonderful journey where you just sit back relax and press the grace button doesn't operate like that you don't sit back relax relax and press the grace button but you have to work hard there are times when you have to sweat it out there are times when you have to press in through difficult times difficult challenges there are times when you have to make sacrifices there are times when you even have to shed some tears. And there are times when you have to work harder and longer than other people. Okay. But you've got to labor because God has given you that empowerment. Right. God has given it to you. So Paul is saying, I am what I am by the grace of God. But the grace has given to me is not wasted. Why does Paul say it's not wasted? Because he says he has labored abundantly than all of the others and then he says yet not i yes he says i labored but it's also by the empowering of god it says god empowers you to labor hard so don't be afraid to work hard don't think kingdom building pastoral ministry working in god's kingdom or ministry is very easy no let me tell you it's hard work you need to work hard and you have to maximize the grace of God that is given to you. Amen? Okay. So now we'll have just two more minutes. Yes, Shahani. Uh, uh, yeah, I have just, a question. Yeah, well, I had two questions. I had a question from earlier. Um, I, I thought that um, knowing your will and your purpose has something to do with uh, your, can you like, please, uh, increase the, sorry to interrupt, can you please increase the volume of your mic and if you can speak a little more slower, it will be to understand you. Can Thank you hear you. me? Yes, I can hear you, but if you can get more articulate and being slower, it will help. Okay. okay. Um, I always thought that your will and your purpose in life is connected to your job and your employment, what you do. But you said earlier that that's not necessarily true, that your job could be one thing and your will and your destiny that God has for you is different. That's what I want. To, I want clarification on that. And also, too, I have a question about the fivefold ministry. I know, can somebody not be in one of those or is everybody called to at least be in, in one of those fivefold ministries? Yeah, thank you for your question. The second question is, 
not everybody in the body of Christ will be in the fivefold ministry. Like I said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul very clearly mentions, he says, and he himself, that is Jesus himself, gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He gave some. That means not everybody. So only a few people are chosen by Jesus Christ to be in those specific offices. But all of us, apart from the specific offices, are, are given a function in the body of Christ. And your first question, if I heard you right, is that, you know, um, our function not necessarily has to be in, we are, have a function in the body of Christ. We have a calling in the body of Christ, but we can also have, uh, you know, God can call us to be a, a leader in the marketplace. And when he calls us to be a leader in the marketplace, he gives us the grace. He gives us the power to fulfill that uh, calling in the marketplace as well. So he's called some of us to be in the marketplace. He's called some of us to be in full-time ministry. But he's called all of us to be part of the body of Christ. So he's given us uh, functions. He has given us different gifts to enable us to fulfill that function. Did that help? Um, yeah, I understand the second question. So I'm trying to make sure I understand the first question. So basically, your your will, your purpose in life may not be the job that you have, like what you do for employment. Am I no, your, your, your will and your pur God's purpose for your life can be your job as well. You know, we have the seven spheres, spheres of society. God can raise you up in the uh, uh, political department, education, uh, uh, advertisement, media, uh, the business field, uh, family. He can raise you up and he can uh, give you a function in those uh, seven spheres, the seven mountains, so-called seven mountains. And he can give you the gifts and the grace to enable you to fulfill that, you know, calling in those seven spheres or those seven uh, mountains. Yes. And he can enable you to bring about the kingdom of God in those seven mountains. Because if all of us are working in the church, then who is going to take the kingdom of God to the marketplace? So he can raise you up to be, to bring about God's kingdom presence, his rule, his government, his, his ethics, his pres his power in these seven spheres or seven mountains that God can uh, use you. Did that help? Okay. Yeah. No, but I, 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 no, it's okay. Thank you. Okay. So maybe if you want to just type out your question or you can post it in the stream page, then maybe I will, I'll have more clarity and I can help you through. Okay. That, is okay. that okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining class and I hope it helped and uh, hope you are able to look into what we've studied and apply that in your lives. Thank you everyone. Have a good rest of the day and a good weekend. God bless you.